following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. And fourth and fifth graders can go that direction with Jessica. As the fourth and fifth graders are taking off, if you would, open your Bibles uh, or electronic device that has a Bible on it. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3 today, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at the first seven verses of 1 Peter. 1 Peter's on the right-hand side of your Bible, or like four or five swipes to the right if you're on an electronic device. Uh, it is a letter. You see the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, story about Jesus' life, his death, resurrection, Acts, history of the church, moving into First and Second Corinthians, uh, and those are the letters to the church on who God is, what God is all about, and then how you are to live out that truth in your everyday life. Uh, we had an extremely eventful weekend. Uh, my youngest, uh, Gianna, was in the hospital on Thursday night. If I talk about it too much, I'll cry. So uh, long story short, we thought it was going to be, we thought it was appendicitis, and she had kind of an infection uh, that was around that appendix, and it is ceasing. We spent the night at the Bremen Motel, and that's the Bremen Hospital. Um, <clears throat> And uh, nurses were getting a kick out of us, you know, I mean, because I guess we're different than other people. And um, uh, she was just a trooper through the whole thing. That infection's going away. It's not contagious. You can touch her if you want to or, or not. Stay away from my daughter. I'll do bad things to you. Um, <laughs> so uh, what a great time to get, like, something in my contact, for real. Um, so anyway, um, so... Uh, yeah, so at the end of the whole kind of endeavor, I looked at Bethany, my wife, and I said, um, I said, man, we're a good team. You know that? And uh, she's like, yeah, we are. And um, so I'm glad she affirms me every once in a while. Um, that's always good. Uh, but Bethany and I have been married, oh man, 15 plus years or something like that. Feels like, feels like two. Um, you know, just so, so wonderful. Um, really? It hasn't been 15? I think we're at 15. 14? We should go somewhere for 15. Where do you want to go? You want to go somewhere? <laughs> we should talk more often while people listen in. You know that? That would be great. Anyway, um, Bethany's folks, uh, awesome, awesome couple. Uh, they've modeled marriage well for us. And then uh, my folks, too, as well, just modeled really good what it, what it means to be in a biblical marriage. And uh, I'm not sure where you're at and your situation, um, but sometimes marriage is, is good, and sometimes marriage is not so good depending on how you were raised, and maybe your marriage is not so good today. Maybe you're finding yourself here and you're happily married, or maybe you're in a spot where you're like, man, um, things are just kind of rough. Uh, and, and God has a word for you, and uh, that shows up in the text here in Peter, because our goal as husband and wife is not to compete with one another, it's to complete each other. And so that's why Bethany and I are a good team, is because we understand how much of a compliment the other person can be and should be in a God-honoring way. So if you look at 1 Peter, um, this is kind of what he has to say. And remember, in the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about authority and what it looks like to be submissive to authority. And what does it look like for children to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the right thing for you to do. And then it talks about employers and employees, and Peter's talking about practical theology here, okay? How you live out these truths that you know about God. And when we see him, he also says, like, um, not only should you be submissive to, like, your parents and, and your employers and, and things like that, you should also uh, obey the law, you should uh, obey the government. For the most part, it's easy for us to do that, but then he really starts cranking down on these people and he looks at the home and he says, the home is the greatest mission field that we have. Everything comes out of the home. He's like, the home is so important and God has designed you and commanded and commissioned you to function for a specific purpose in the home. And if you're reading this letter and you get to chapter three and you're sitting around, you're probably in a house of somebody and you're hearing these words to the believers, chapter one, um, who are scattered in dispersion. They're all over the place. And they've just been told all of these things about submission to authority and stuff like that. And then Peter says in verse 1 of chapter 3, likewise. 
And there's the connector piece to all that we know in chapter 2. Likewise what? Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Okay, so you start praying for me right now, all right? He says, be subject to your husbands, so... Well, we'll get to the so in, in just a second. Jump down to verse 7. Likewise, because it's unfair of us to just look at women. He's going to talk to husbands too as well. Likewise, verse 7, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. So both partner has purpose. Showing honor to the woman. And then he says the weaker vessel, and that's totally misconstrued in our society today, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Man, what a huge passage of Scripture here. Let me just pray for clarity and then we'll progress. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us be clear with the text here this morning, big passage of Scripture. And it's important that we understand this in the proper context so that we can live out this truth in our society because people are watching. Unbelievers are watching Christian marriages and our divorce rates are higher than non-Christians. Our homes are oftentimes more broken than non-Christians and non-believers. And we have to radically change how we see the roles of a husband and a wife and children so that we could realign to your purpose. So that we would honor you in all that we think, say, and do. So the people who are far from you come to know you, but also so that other people who know you would be encouraged and see that there is purpose in the home. To honor and glorify the living God, our living hope, our cornerstone. This is so important for us to have peace and joy. So I pray, God, that we would be very, very clear this morning on what is transpiring. And help us to align ourselves to your word and your will. God, make it so this morning. Amen? Okay, so if you're reading this, all right, you you kind of want to uh, hurt Peter. Amen? Like, what are you talking about? Well, let's see what's going on. Let's go back a little bit and let's talk about what's transpiring in New Testament in regards to the text. There's three people groups that are present in this society. Romans... Greeks and Jews. Romans, Greeks, and Jews. And the important thing is, is all three of these people groups would have looked at women and they would have said, you are property. You have no rights. Uh, They would look at you and they would say, hey, we're just going to see you as something that can be distributed. Okay? So in women in our society today, when you look at it and you go, man, we're oppressed. You have no idea what oppression is. Because in the New Testament, you were property. You didn't have a voice. You didn't get to speak. And Peter's going to take women, he's going to elevate them, and he's going to bring them up where they should be, not only in the eyes of God, but also in the eyes of society. See, marriages were not made for love way back in the Bible. As a matter of fact, they were for the mutual benefit of the parents that were involved. So you would get together, and you would say, hey, my kid kind of has a thing for your kid, and I got a farm, and you got a farm, and if we get together, we got two farms, right? Right? And so they would essentially start to negotiate a little bit of these things based off these children who were young. In Judaism, marriages were arranged by the bride's father, and they didn't take your feelings into consideration. Now, I don't know if I'm totally 100% against arranged marriages, because I think I, I know better than my kids, right? So maybe we should bring this back. Um, and uh, the older they get, they're more they're like, nope, not going to happen. Uh, but oftentimes, couples wouldn't even meet before the ceremony. So they were partnered at a young age, and, they, and that stood, okay, for lack of a better word, it stood until they were ready to get married. Engagement was a really interesting process. In the Roman and Greek culture, the bride's father paid the groom's family a dowry. But in Jewish culture, the father paid the bride's family. And they would negotiate this price, and it wasn't always just money. Sometimes they would say, hey, I'll do this service for you, or I'll give you this property, or whatever the case is. But engagement in that society was binding as marriage was. And you know this is true, because if we look at Mary and Joseph, right? Right? You know the story back in the Bible, Mary and Joseph, and they had Jesus. And uh, Joseph finds out that Mary's with child, and what does he do? He resolves to divorce her quietly. But they weren't married. They were engaged. 
So the contract was binding, okay, if you were engaged. And so the families looked at this situation and circumstance, and they would say, you are going to be together, and you're going to have a successful marriage, and it's forced upon these children. And then you get to the uh, wedding ceremony, and the bride would be up here, and the groom would be up here, and they would look at each other, and most of the time they met for the first time. They're on the stage, and the pastor or rabbi or whoever it was says, this is your husband, and this is your wife, and that's the way it is. And you love them. And you take care of them, and you make sure that your home is on the right track. And your family would sit there, and they would all agree. But they weren't agreeing that you were in love. They were agreeing because it was mutually beneficial for them. Now, then you would go to the reception. And this is where Jesus turns water into wine. And uh, all the family's there. All the friends are there. All the relatives are there. And they are excited, but they're not excited about the fact that you got married. They're excited about the fact that the families benefit from the situation. So if you're a wife in that time period, you look at your husband and you think to yourself, this is the guy who I'm supposed to marry? This is the person who I'm supposed to marry? And if you're a husband, you looked at your wife and you thought, this woman's going to do whatever I tell her to do. And Peter's going to change that whole demographic. He's going to totally, radically change that. Because here's the big picture. God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. And Jesus, using Peter's pen, changes marriage into this holy institution, a symbolic expression of what it looks like for both partners to be submissive to one another. It's a beautiful symbol of what it means to be in a relationship with God through faith in Christ. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Verse 1. Likewise, in the same way, Likewise, in the same way, connecting to chapter 2, verse 13, accept authority of every human institution. Marriage is a human institution, but it is God-ordained. Now, wives, likewise, from all these other human institutions, you should submit to your husbands for a specific purpose. What is the purpose? To bring honor and glory to God. Husbands, you are called to lead your wives. Why? Why? To bring honor and glory to God. Now it goes without saying, but we need to say it today. Circle that word, wives. We believe, we know that God's word teaches that marriage is one man and one woman coming together underneath covenant relationship with God. Okay, they're coming underneath God. And if you're in the New Testament time period, God has set up this man for you, wife. And uh, God has set up, man, this wife for you, okay? So these people come together underneath this covenant. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in a legal binding contract called marriage. But marriage at the core is only a biblical institution. And it's funny how many people in our society today run to the Christian institution of marriage while so many uh, Christians run away from the Christian institution of marriage. Scratch my head on that one. Wives, one man, one woman, connected underneath the covenant of God, be subject to your own husbands. Your word or your passage might say, submit, submit and subject, same word. Often taught in other places in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 5. Paul tells the church in Ephesus, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives, you should submit in everything to your husbands. This is a picture of Christ restoring the church. Colossians chapter 3. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. So you can follow your husband so long as he does not command you to go away from Scripture. You are submissive to him. You follow him. You follow his leadership as he is following the Lord. Where does this come from? Well, we go way back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 and we realize it was one of Eve's consequences for sin. It says in that text that the husband would rule or be in charge over you. This was due to her unwillingness to consult her husband to eat of the fruit. Adam's standing right next to her. She takes the fruit, and she doesn't consider his opinion before participating in the eating of the fruit. She just goes ahead and does it. And he says, okay, then your husband will rule over you. He'll be in charge over you as he should be in charge over you. And that's a setup for the gospel. Okay, because in Judaism, remember, Jesus, okay, uh, is the promised Messiah. We know that to be true, and he comes and redeems his people. He comes and calls for his bride, the church. 
In Jewish culture, the groom's father paid the bride's family a price to negotiate the cost. And that is exactly what God the Father did. He paid the price by giving Jesus his son for his bride's sin. Now think about it. With us as believers, we didn't choose Jesus. He chose us. And so just as the, wife, the woman is sitting here looking at it, at the husband, she's thinking to herself, I didn't choose you. Your family chose me. Your father chose me. That's exactly what it is like for us in a relationship with Jesus. He chose us. So you have two choices. You can either accept him or you can reject him. You can either serve him or you can go far away from him. So what is the application in just those two uh, verses, verse 1 and verse 7, to wives? Your submission is a picture of the church's submission to Christ. That's positive, not negative. So don't be rebellious or commit treason against your husband or contradict him. Your opportunity, not your obligation, is to compliment your husband. And this is pulling women up in society. Peter is pulling them up. He's saying, you're a compliment to your husband. And husbands, if you don't see your wife as a compliment, there's something wrong with you because she knows you better than everybody else. She knows you better than your best friend knows you. She knows you better than your job knows you. And if you don't think she knows you, then just ask her. She'll tell you she knows you better than anybody else. There's so many times I walk in my home, my wife looks at me and goes, how'd that go? And I said, why didn't you say something? She goes, because you didn't ask. She is a compliment to you. If you were reading that in this society, or, or, in, or in the New Testament society, you would have thought to yourself, Peter says that I have purpose. A wife has purpose. You would have been ecstatic. And you would have been doing this to your husband all day long. I have purpose. Now watch this though, in verse 7, to husbands, you are accountable to God on how you treat your wife. You're not to be faithless to her, you're not to be unloving to her, you're not to be impatient with her. Now go to verse 7 and look at this real quick, it says, show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Do you know what the word weaker means there? Physical strength, it has nothing to do with her intellectual knowledge. It has nothing to do with her inner character. It has nothing to do with her being incompetent. Peter says she's weaker than you physically. You would win in a fight against her. Okay? And because of that, you are called as a leader to protect her. You're called as a leader to watch over her, to watch over her spiritual life, her intellectual life. You are called to honor her and help her in as many ways possible. You are called to pick her up. You are called to encourage her. You are called to love her. You are called to tell her how beautiful she is and how smart she is and how wonderful she is. Constantly, it should be on the tip of your tongue every single day. I remember when I was growing up, my dad... uh, he would always get up no matter what he was doing when my mom came home and he would greet her at the door. I fail at this all the time. I think to myself, that'd be wonderful. I bet you Bethany would like that a lot. And in my sinful nature, pray for me. I fall short and I'm sorry. But my dad would get up and he would go and he would greet my mom. He would open the door. And he would take her back. She would say, he'd say, hey, hey, Denise, how was your day? Hey, sweetie, how was your day? Did you have a good day? I'm like, you're like a puppy. <laughs> Like, leave the woman alone. She just got home. And he would kiss her and he would put her down. And, and she'd, go, she'd go, good to see you too. And she's like, what did you do today? And he's like, well, I dusted for you and I got the laundry all done. And we don't do laundry. I don't do laundry in my house because that's a major sin. Because um, I didn't know that you don't dry things. Like, and, and whatever. Okay, totally irrelevant to the sermon. Um, most amens from the front row I've gotten in a long time. He would care for her. He would bring her up. My mom went to school. She got uh, two or three degrees. Man, like her, his whole goal was to build her up. That's exactly what he's saying here. Your wife is the weaker, not strong as you are, physical strength. And so you're called to love her as, as many ways possible. Stay with her, respect her, listen to her, be considerate of her, and love her unselfishly as you love the Lord. Whoa. So if you're reading that in that society, wives have purpose and husbands have purpose. Now you're probably sitting here thinking, 
what if my husband doesn't know Jesus? I mean, what if you got married and now all of a sudden you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, I came to know the Lord, but he didn't. What do I do there? Well, Peter has some words for it. Or what if it's the other case? What if it's the other way around? Look at verse 1, the second part. He says, so that when you function like this, so that even if some do not obey the word, and what he's talking about there is the acceptance of the gospel, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So the first thing that we see here in the text is, if he's not a believer, the wife has the opportunity to get her husband to come to know Jesus because of her conduct in the home. All right? Some don't obey the word. That's talking about husbands who are disobedient to God. Can be one. So what does Peter do here? He gives great hope to spouses who are listening in and thinking that their marriage is completely over. The same is true for us today. You might be sitting here today and you might have thought to yourself before you walked into the church doors, this is it. Tomorrow we're going to get a divorce. I'm done. Can't stand her anymore. Can't stand him anymore. She drives me crazy. He drives me crazy. We're done. And if you read that passage of Scripture, God says, you're not done. You don't walk out. And some of you have had that happen to you. And I'm sorry, it happens. It, it transpires. And if you're reading this in this text, you, you would have thought, I can win my husband to the Lord. I can win them. I can win my, uh, my wife to the Lord. And it's a lot like submitting to authority. For the most part, it's easy for us to submit to authority, isn't it? I, mean, I can go 55 down the highway. I don't always want to, but I can. It's pretty easy for us to obey the law. And if you're that wife in that society, it's pretty easy to obey your husband. He's not asking you to commit pagan acts. He's, and, if, and you're living with your parents anyway, so you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, it's not that hard. For the most part, you can do what your husband is asking you to do. And what, what's transpiring here is, is what transpires in our world. You get saved, you come to know Jesus, and you think you're better than everybody else, and you don't have to do things. But Jesus says, if you want to be like me, you've got to serve everybody else. And so when we see people who come to know Jesus, they all of a sudden get this like complex to them. And we, look, we sit there and we're dumbfounded. We're like, why do you have a complex? You should have a servant attitude, not a complex. He says, this wins your husband to the Lord. Believing wives could interact with their husband and make it work in order to save the marriage and often her life because she's looked at like property and, dispo and, and she's disposable. And she doesn't have to participate in her husband's pagan religion or submit to the actions that dishonor God. She can win him to the Lord. So she starts to act like Jesus. And the husband looks at her and goes, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I treat you like garbage. And you constantly come back and you love me and you take care of me. And she looks at him and she says, I've accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she wins him back. See, the problem then is the same problem that we have now. It's a fight over who's right and who's wrong. Think about your last fight, those of you who are married, okay? And just be honest, did you want to be right? Or did you want to compliment? Now, if I'm honest, we don't fight anymore. We've been married too long. <clears throat> okay, it's just not worth it anymore. It's not true at all. Come on. It's often about who's right and who's wrong, right? I'm right. And then he'd come up and he'd show up in my office. Pastor Jordan, say I'm right. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, it's not about who's right and who is wrong. Marriage is 100 to 100. It's not 50 50. Tell her that she should do this. Tell him that he should do this. Whoa, hold on a second. True love seeks the other person's best, does it not? Let me ask you a question we ask every single couple who's engaged that we do their wedding. We look at them and they're in love, the googly eyed, right? And love is not a feeling, love is a choice. And we look at them and I say, okay, you're driving down the highway and you're with your soon-to-be spouse, you're engaged. And uh, well, let's just go one step further. Let's say you're driving down the highway and you're married. You're, you just got married, you've been married for like a week or whatever the case is. All of a sudden, you get hit by a car. Your spouse is completely 100% uh, dependent upon you from here on out. They can't take care of themselves. They're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. They can't feed themselves. They can't do anything for themselves. They, you are solely responsible for putting 
uh, for taking care of them, right? Would you still, would you still remain married? What do they say? Yeah, absolutely. I would take care of them. I would, I would watch over them. I, w- I would do whatever was necessary. Then you go and live your marriage for the rest of your life that way, as if your husband or wife, whatever it is, can no longer take care of your needs, but you can always take care of their needs. True love is seeking the other person's best. You go home today and you self-sacrifice on a daily basis for your spouse and you watch how awesome your marriage will be. You never expect anything in return. You never expect them to repay a favor. You take care of them. You seek their best in all things. That means they're more important than the TV set. They're more important than your cell phone. They're more important than anything else in the whole entire world. They're dependent upon you. Watch your marriage take off. The reason we have problems in marriages is because we live for ourselves and not for our spouse. The reasons we have problems in our relationship with Jesus is because we live for ourselves and not our Savior. Amen? And that's why you fall short. It's because we're more worried about our opinions instead of God's praise. So wives, you could win your husband to the gospel in Christ-like conduct, and that can only come from the gospel. And that submission did not mean blind obedience or being inferior. A wife who just accepted her husband's authority and accepted the relationship that God had designed gave her husband the ability to lead and have responsibility. And wives, give your husband the ability to lead and have responsibility. Let him lead. You're a compliment, not competition. You compliment him. And it's the same way for husbands to wives. You compliment her, right? An unbelieving husband will see the gospel clearly when a wife strives for completion over competition. So the question on the table is, is our conduct like Christ in our marriage or is it more selfish and self-centered? You can only answer that. Okay, so here's, here's, here's what Peter does, right? So if you're, if you're listening to that and you're a woman, you're thinking to yourself, then where's my worth? Where's my worth as a woman? That's a good question. Verse 3. And ladies, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to speak to you as, as honest as I possibly can because you need to hear this. Do not let your adorning be external. Braiding of your hair, putting on gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. <laughs> so what he's saying is, there's nothing wrong with braiding your hair. There's nothing wrong with wearing jewelry. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? As a matter of fact, my, my kids love to play dress up, and I do this to them all the time. As a matter of fact, I'll even paint their nails. I can braid hair. I and mean, we never had boys. I don't know what to do with boys. But I... I can braid hair, okay? And don't think negatively about me because of it, all right? It's my kids. Again, don't touch them. They're my kids. What he's saying here is, he's saying, that's not a problem. And when my kids, they play dress up. They look at me, and what do they say? Dad, do I look pretty? Dad, they came down to stairs today, and they, Dad, I look pretty. And you know what I do? I say, sit down. Don't do that, right? Boys watching over there, whatever the case is. And I'll look at them and I'll say, I'll say, I think you're pretty without all that stuff. I point at their heart and I say, God doesn't see this the way that people see. The Lord looks at the heart and internally you're pretty. And that's exactly what Peter says to, to these women. Let your, look at verse 4, adorning your beauty be the hidden person of your heart. That radically transformed, changed internal organ with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. Now you read the word quiet and you instantly think to yourself, see, he doesn't want me to talk. You're missing it. Which in God's sight is very precious. For this is exactly how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. And he gives an example of Sarah who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, just as were Abraham's offspring. You are also a daughter of Sarah. And if you do good and you don't fear anything that is frightening, you'll be able to do those specific things. Now, he's talking about the heart that has been changed by the gospel. And this is important. Beauty that is of the heart is described of three things. Women, write these down. That you're gentle... And guys who don't have a a wife, this is what you're looking for in a wife. Meaning you're humble and considerate and not rude. That you are humble 
and considerable and not rude. You're considerate of others. You're considerate of your husband. You're considerate of your children. You're not rude. Number two, quiet. Calm, serene, tranquil. If I am the ocean with ginormous tsunami-like waves, Bethany is the ocean floor, consistent and calm as the storm rages on. Right? There are so many times where in my house, we just, it just spews. I, I, this is what I do for a living. I talk, so I just talk. And Bethany waits. And then she says, do you feel better? What are you going to do? That's it's serenity. That's, that's calmness. When you come home and you're amped up, your wife has the ability to just, in a quiet spirit, calm the situation down. That's a beautiful trait. Humble and considerate, gentle, quiet means an attitude of calmness, one who is still in seasons of chaos. And look at the third thing he says. This comes from your spirit. This is your temperament, your disposition, your frame of mind. One of the, one of the best parts about Bethany is she constantly points back to, but what does God's word say? That's a powerful woman. But what does the word of God say? Our temperament and disposition must, also, must always be like Christ. Such beauty is imperishable, ageless, and it contradicts outward decorations which only last for a little while. This is true beauty that always lasts, never changes, comes from a spirit that has been transformed by the gospel. Is there anything wrong with braiding your hair? No. But understand, brown hair goes gray. Is there anything wrong with putting jewelry on? No, but understand gold tarnishes. Anything wrong with wanting to look our best? No, but that's not where your beauty lies at. Your beauty lies in your heart, which is where the gospel sits. Knowing this, Peter's audience would have knew that in order to be an heir of God's promise, it had to come from being children of Abraham or being a daughter of Sarah, which was held in high regard. So notice here how Peter pulls up women and puts them as a compliment, not a competition to their husband. And he calls at the same time husbands to lead well so that they can be a compliment. Isn't that amazing? This is the the standard for which people are watching. And he closes with this warning to husbands, if you're not considerate, you're not respectful to your wives, your prayers can be hindered. He's addressing husbands specifically that you live in a relationship with God so much so in the home that it transfers out to the world. Jesus said that if you have a problem with a fellow believer, you must make it right with that person before coming to worship. And that principle carries over into family relationships. If men use their position to mistreat their wives, their relationship with God would suffer. And so he shouldn't expect to have a vital ministry in life or prayer if he was mistreating his wife in any way. It is just as much of a call to be a godly husband as it is to be a godly wife. How are we doing? Mm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture, um, it's so easy for us to take this out of context. It's so easy for us to look at this in a way where we would think to ourselves, uh, that, that Peter's being demeaning to women and he's not. He's, he's building them up. And I know that um, the women in the New Testament time period who are viewed as property, it, that, that still happens in today's society too as well. And I pray for the women in our congregation, those who are listening online or will listen to this later, that they would see themselves and their worth in you and in you alone. They would have the opportunity to see themselves as a child of God. And that they would see that they have purpose in the marriage to compliment, uh, not to compete with their husbands. And may the spirit of um, competing cease within the home. May husband and wife strive to seek the other person's best. May the wife strive to seek her husband's best. May her goal be to love him in such a way where he excels in his relationship with you. 
May she encourage him. May she build him up. May she strive to find ways that she can push him into your word. And may she continue to push him in in prayer. And may she lead her children in, in seeing these things. And if there's shortcoming on the husband's side, that she would use those as teaching opportunities for her kids. And also that she would see her own shortcomings. And for us as husbands, would you help us to lead in such a way our wives that would be honoring and glorifying to you as we are going to be held accountable one day to you because of this divine institution that you have entrusted to our care. Help us not to view our wives as property. Help us to look at our wives as this compliment. Help us to continue to build her up, to encourage her, to uplift her, so that she could see her worth. Help us to lead our wives to places where uh, they can be beneficial for the gospel. That we wouldn't belittle them. That we would love them in a way that you love us. As our model of a healthy marriage is to love our wives just like you love the church. That you would lay down your life for us. We lay down our lives for them. May we do so in such a way that is honoring and glorifying to you. And may we go home today and and plead to our spouses uh, how we have fallen short of that standard. and, And seek Uh, them and and ask them for help to continue to live uh, to this godly standard. May we be humble husbands who seek after our wives for help. Let us not be proud. Help us, God. We, We desperately need your help today in our society with marriage, as it is such a picture of your relationship with us. And as we come now to the Lord's Supper and communion and and we think about this, we, we empty ourselves as what a beautiful picture it is. That you died on the cross for us. That you came and sought us. That even when we didn't seek you, you're right in front of us and, and you, you plead with us to have a relationship with you. And you restore us and you make us whole. You give us peace and joy. God, as we take the elements here in just a few short moments We ask in this symbolic representation that is before us that it would allow us to take a moment to not just get right with you, but get right with our spouse, with our community, with our neighborhood, with our world. That we would take this moment to just be still before you and remember the great sacrifice that you demonstrated for us so that we could demonstrate to others as we participate God in communion would you restore unto us as we've already prayed a joy of our salvation and renew a right spirit within us it's in your name that we pray amen thank you for listening to the community gospel church podcast if you would like to support this ministry financially simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.